Thanks, thanks for making the time, Master Lloyd. Anytime, anytime for you. Quick introduction, Lloyd, jo Lloyd Irvin Jr. is one of the top Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coaches in the world, creating world champions from the blue belt to the black belts, including homegrown and all of this as an American. UFC coach, author, marketer extraordinaire, and the list goes on. Jiu-Jitsu world champion, Valetudo fighter, uh, <laughs> you, and, and much more, right? So, yeah, sure. Been in the game for a long time. Uh, legend, American legend. Um, thank, thanks, thanks for making the time. And my pleasure. So, how, how did the story begin for you? We've got Hoist Gracie behind me, right? Yeah. How did the story begin for you getting into this world, getting sucked into this world of wearing geese and, and fighting Valley Tudo? and this, this whole this whole realm. It's funny, one of my frat brothers named Dwayne Johnson called me like three or four o'clock in the morning one day and said, he said dog, you have, to, you have to see this video. This, this guy is doing this, he's breaking people up. You gotta check it out. So he came over to my mom's house about four o'clock in the morning. We popped the VHS tape in and it was the UFC one and it was Hoyce Gracie. And, he, and listen, for him to drive over, over to my mom's house at four o'clock in the morning, he knew for a fact that I would love, he knew me. And from that, from that second, I was in love. And I was like, what on earth is this? And so I, I, I got involved. I, I wanted to find, figure out about, learn more about Hoist Gracie and what this is about. Of course, I found out it was Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. There was no place in, in, the, in America that I knew of except Torrance, California. I think it was Torrance. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up moving to California, staying on my frat brother's floors, couches, bouncing from home to home because I, I was really, really motivated to learn this. And I had a record label at the time trying to get that off the ground. So I figured, you know what? I can kill two birds with one stone, go to California, the mecca of, of the music industry, and then two, learn about Grace and Jitsu. And very quickly, I went and went on a Saturday to Torrance and did a, a private lesson, I mean, a free introductory class. And it was afterwards, it was great, but afterwards it was like, don't quote me on this, but like $300, $400 a month, it was a lot. And at that time, I didn't have any money. I was just down there winging it. And um, so I stayed out in California. There was a bunch of different places that were saying they were doing jiu-jitsu. Right. But for me, you know, any type of grappling, you know, being in California was, was very interesting for me. And then I ended up having a situation where I had to come back home. And um, I found, ran to a guy named Brian Welch. He told me about a uh, Brazilians in Rockville, Maryland, it was called Yamazaki Dala Academy. Mm -hmm. And that's where I went. I went there, did my first free industri industry class, signed up for unlimited classes for $100 a month. Mm -hmm. And my whole life was built around wanting to be Hoist Gracie. And as far as Valley Tudo, I, I came there to be Hoist Gracie. I wanted to be Hoist Gracie the first day. Um, they put it through a gi on me. After that, they're like, you know, I bought a gi. And then I was, they, trick, they tricked me into doing the gi. And then I fell in love with the sport. And then I, I had my first, Valley Tudo fight probably, I think, the first one in six months. I was the Yamazaki Dollar enforcer back, you know, back in the day. Right, there was, okay. Everyone wanted to come in and challenge the instructor, and I was I was a blue belt that did all the challenge matches for the academy and everything, and um, that's how I got started. So how did that, because I saw the, one of the old Half Gracie VHS tapes, You and uh, you, I always see you in the mix on how you were in the, in the VHS tapes. So how did that because you went to Torrance, right? You said you went to Torrance, so in Southern California. But Half Gracie was up north, so how did that, uh, was that, what's the story behind that? So at my very first Valley Tudo fight, um, a guy named Max Coates who was the manager of Half Gracie, you know, when he was fighting. And he saw me fight. He's like, oh, man, you have to, you have to come with us and this and that. And I want, to sign, I want you to sign to my management company. I want to manage you. You can go to, you can go to the UFC, blah, blah, blah. And then and I, you know, I was thinking about it. He messaged me and said, hey, I got Hauf coming in town to Virginia this weekend to shoot some video series. Would you like to come up and train with Hauf and be in the video series, blah, blah, You know, I was like, oh. you know, I'm like well, of course. And so I, I ended up signing with him. I went to Virginia. That's where I met Hauf the very first time. Okay. I got to train, got to train with him. And I uh, got to be in the video series. And um, it was very, very interesting. That was my first Hauf Gracie experience. It was awesome. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about that. What was that? What was your impression of Half Gracie meeting Half Gracie for the first time? Listen, it was ultra intense, you know, because at the time, like I said, I was a full Gracie head. You know, I think, think you know, Gracie just was magic. And when I, I trained with him, 
uh, we were doing some value too though, and I kicked him. And then, then, then I, when I kicked him, the way he looked at me, he turned red, but he, he was like, yes, yes. <laughs> he got so excited. And then he took me down, man. He beat the crap out of me. I, I couldn't move. I was like, oh, this is awesome. Um, but he, he, he respected the fact that I wasn't, we weren't sparring and, he, and I was chilling, you know, like yeah. I actually kicked him. And, um, and then I get, we got to form a respect right then and there. And, um, but it was awesome. It was, it was very intense. Everything was intense. It was, Get, are, are we allowed to curse, curse on this on your podcast? Yeah, we want, yeah. Listen, it was give no fucks. <laughs> he didn't give a fuck about nothing, and that's how the training went. And it was awesome. And then you know he showed me some cool stuff. You know, going into the the video series, and then I was asking stuff on the back end. He was very open. Um, and uh, yeah, it was awesome. And I, I met David Camarillo through him because David came down <laughs> one time, and uh, yeah, it was awesome. How was the experience going to the Torrance Academy back in those days? Well, it, it felt like it was it was very interesting from the fact of I was just I was just in awe, you know what I'm saying? Like a like a kid in a candy store. So I can't really I don't even really remember too much. I just know where I was still, walking. You're out. still a kid in the candy store. Till, yeah. till today. I see yeah. at the tournaments, yeah. watching all the guys. <laughs> I love it. Love it. But back then it was very it was like mythical. Yeah. What was it meeting Horace Gracie? So I n- I never met Ho- the first time I ever met Hoist in person. Okay. If my memory serves me correctly, the first time I met him in person was when we when we both got inducted oh. to the Grappling Hall of Fame together, and um, we were on the stage and you know they called his net called my name and I was up there he called his name he came up there and uh, came shake my hand like it, like and I told him the story I said man. I look up to you and you say you're the reason I got involved in this, blah blah blah. And he's like, Oh, cool, cool, cool. And there was a guy named John Simons that had a, a affiliate school under him at the time in Virginia. He was like, Hey Sean John Simons told me to say uh tell you wish uh, send you send you my love, blah blah blah, you know. So um but I don't I don't I've I've never met him outside of that day. I don't think I've ever seen him ever in person ever again. He's not determined, you know. Right, right. Oh, right. I, I did I did see him at a nag and another nag at, at an event, but um, yeah. You never bought him out to to do a seminar at your gym? No, I mean, I've never really been into the seminars and stuff, you know. And then by the time I got around to start doing their seminars, I had you know the whole thing about them not really teaching nothing at the seminars and holding back. I w- I went to a Fabio Santos seminar, and um, his seminar was all super awesome. But I've never been to one of Hoyt's. Yeah. I was just curious, you know, I mean, maybe later on in the years, just as he was, the years went by and he had already been past his, his prime, you know, because I brought him out to New Mexico years later. And it was like, he still was like, you know, somebody, we went to the, at the airport and the baggage claim guy looked at the name and looked up. He was like, Hoist Gracie, what? <laughs> and then, you know, just in town, it, it was, you know, it was just, he was still a celebrity. And that was years after, I think he was fighting at, after he was done fighting, you know, so. He'll be a celebrity forever. Yeah, so man, um, uh, was Helio around at those times too? Who Helio Gracie? Yes, yes, yes. Any the Gracie uh, or any was Corian Gracie there at the time? Did you get any, any experience with Or Corian was there, but it was like I can't even remember the guy's name who taught the private taught the intro class, but it wasn't them. It wasn't Horian didn't teach it. I forgot the guy's name at the time, but um, I got to meet Helio one time at a UFC. Took a fo- I took a photo with him and everything, and I, and I lost the photo. It's so irritating. But um, I, like to this day, I, I would pay somebody some money if they found that photo for me. Because I, I, mean, I, I have one picture that I took at the Hicks at a Hicks and Gracie tournament, and I'm okay. very proud to have that picture. <laughs> it's one one picture. I have one picture. I, I had the opportunity. Um, and so you, did you say you had your music? Is that what you wanted to go to LA for that? Or to California? Yeah, I got a label called um, Dog for Entertainment. And I had one artist named Strong. So I, we, had, we had laid down an album. We had, had a couple of singles. I had a frat brother who was very high up at Def Jam. Um, so I started with him and then he introduced me to different people. Then I was started making my, my rounds. I, later on, I found out that the, the music, my music wasn't probably as good as I thought it was at the time, but I was out there trying. That's cool. That's cool. You came out nice. And then uh, I was gonna ask you. Uh, so, I, like, what what made you like? I guess 
kind of pull the trigger. That's just your personality to kind of go across the country to get after it as soon as you like something. That's just me. Like, there's no, there's no hesitation. It's like if I want to do something and I believe in it, I'm, I'm going all in. I want to, I want to immediately go to the highest elite level as possible that I can possibly do. Um, like, if I had enough money back then, if I had money, I would have went to Brazil. You know what I'm saying? Like, like wh- whatever the e- highest level that I can do, I'm going to jump all in feet first and yeah. do the best I can with what I got. And that, so it wasn't even a thought. I just need to figure out the logistics. Um, I, like I said, didn't have any money, but I had a lot of connections through my fraternity. So I just kind of started contacting um, through the book everyone that I know I ever met in California to get there, to give me more contact, more contact. Because, you know, you're, you're, where, you're where you're welcome at some point. Um, so if I could stay at this person's house for a week and this person's house for a week, I would keep on doing that. And then one of my, my chapter bros that played, actually played at Bowie State, Keith Mann, um, Keith, heavy one, he um, ended up living in California. Then he ended up putting me up for a while, quite a while. So uh, I was going to say about the, the you, you travel around, like I have stories, like I went to Carlos Machado in Texas. I went to California, Trinidad Machado's there. What was your, where, where did you, where did you travel around? What did you get around to, to learn? To learn the art. So it's interesting Korea because my my instructor, like Leo Dalla and Mario Yamazaki, had a falling out like early on, and Dalla moved back to Brazil, and Mario stayed in Maryland Rockville, and I, I didn't like the fact the way it went down, so I ended up leaving also, but I didn't I didn't have anywhere to go, so I ended up opening my own school six months in. I got my blue belt in thirty days, right. six months. In six months in, Dollar left, and so here I am with a martial arts school. Six months in, it was a six-month blue belt. So I, um, I got a lot of videos from Dollar of like Mario, Mario, um, Mario Bustamante, Amari Batech, Paletto, all these guys when they're white. I'm sorry, blue and purple belts. I started watching their matches, um, and then Pedro Cavajo had a had a VA video series. I think I got world 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 martial arts they were like video guys back then yeah. i had those tapes and then i started learning from that good i started traveling a little bit my, my the two biggest stories i remember one was i went to henzo gracie philadelphia he was partners with craig kuko at the time yeah. and I, I went in there they were doing no gi so i was training they asked what belt i was i said it was a blue belt so they let me train and i was like beating most of the guys very easily and then they say, oh, man, you're very good. I said, you sure you're a blue belt? I said, yeah. And then they told another guy, said, this, um, train with this guy. His name is Ricardo. So me and Ricardo went. And then, you know, you remember those matches, like, back in the day, I started rolling with him. And the next thing you know, I look around, and everyone in the entire room has stopped rolling. And everyone's <laughs> looking at him. So I now say, okay, this is, this is their guy. This is their guy. But in my mind, I didn't know what belt he was. So I'm like, he's a blue belt, too. So we just battling, 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 battling. It was like 30, 40 minutes. And he ended up getting me at the end of a choke. And then we laid beside each other. He's like, man, you know Blue Belt. I said, like, man, you know Blue Belt either. He, then it, it ended up being Hakaro Almeida. He was a brown belt at the time. And that was an awesome experience because out besides Dollar, I'd never rolled with anybody that could do that. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and wouldn't stop and would keep pushing the pace. They had techniques. And it, that was awesome. And then I ended up going to Atlanta where Jock Ray was having a seminar with Fabio Grigel. And um, I stayed there for an entire week with one of my frat brothers. And that was a very great experience. Um, and it was funny, too, because uh, at the end of that, Jacques Ray had talked to me about, like, maybe becoming a member of Alliance and, you know, going on their banner. And I had really thought about it because being there for an entire week, training with Fabio, training with all the guys, and it was like, whoa, this is this is like amazing. It was like I think it was. It wasn't even Alliance. I don't think back then. I think it was Masters because right. on the on the wall it was like a green, green, white, green, white, and orange Masters logo. Oh, and yeah. then there there was another team. They had they had a split within their group. So there was Masters and there was something else. But what I don't think it was Alliance. Was it Braza? Braza. Or, yeah, it was something so, going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so there's a there's a video tape of me rolling with Fabio Grigel. I was a blue belt with no gi, and that was that was from there. And that's when um, Fabio ended up um, naming me the, the king of leg locks. Um, I was going for leg locks, showing, showing all the stuff we did in Sambo. Um, 
but I, like I said, that those are two big major trips. And Fabio, not Fabio, Fabio Santos. Fabio Santos, listen, Fabio Santos was so interesting because he was little and he was old and it was the first, it's like grappling with a gi, but there's nothing inside the gi until it becomes something inside the gi and the gi becomes like concrete. And then once you lock that in, then it becomes soft again. Like, I had never rolled with anybody with that style. And that, at that point, I was still young, and I was still starting to understand that there's so many different styles and, and, and feels. You got the pressure people, you got the you know lax people, and you got the people that are the swimming. It's so many different, you know, it, at that time, it was so awesome because I don't understand that no one was teaching me, and I'm just trying to figure out things on my own. But Fabio Gugel, I mean, Fabio Santos was very interesting because that's the first time I ever ever felt that style. And I think that's probably the last time I ever felt that style, honestly. Um, but it was awesome. It's interesting that Dean Lister, right, came out of that school. Yeah. School and and um, yeah, super interesting. How'd you get into leg locks? So there was a, I had a, I had a student that started coming to train with me. His name was Eric Grove. And he was like a third or fourth degree black belt in Sambo. So I'm, uh, let me make the distinction just be, to be clear, because every time I say this, it always becomes a big thing. So the ASA, which is American Sambo Academy, um, was a very popular, very big organization in America. Mm. And in their organization, in the ASA, they gave ranking for Sambo. Because people say, oh, there's no ranking in Sambo. Well, in Russia, there may be no ranking. But in ASA, American Sambo Academy, there was ranking. So Eric was a multiple, he was like a two, second or third degree black belt in ASA Sambo. Okay. And they would always go to California, train with Gokar. Yeah. Gokar had a, you know, their thing. And so he was, he, he was a Sambo guy, but he wanted to learn Jitsu. And I was a Jitsu guy, you know, only blue belt, but I, the, the leg locks were cool, you know. But it was just, it was a different philosophy because for the ensemble, you can mount me, take my back, knee on belly me, and it's still zero zero. It, the only thing that matters is, is the submission. That's true. Yeah. So um, he was training for a while, and then I started training with him, and we started exchanging. And then, then I became obsessed. Like I, I have OCD, so I get obsessive compulsive about things I'm I'm interested in. And so I went through my leg lock phase, and there was a there was a time that. All we did was leg locks because one, it was a great equalizer. Most Jiu-Jitsu people weren't, didn't know how to do it. We were getting our ass kicked so bad at tournaments uh, for Jiu-Jitsu. Like I wasn't that good, didn't know what I was doing. I, I was really young. So on the Nogi side, we would just, we would just heel hook all these blue, purple, brown belts um, very, very easily. So that was the easiest path. So I just continued that until I decided I didn't want to be losing in this gi. Um, events anymore and I wanted to you know build the team strong so I focused more on that and then I got to a point in my life where I was like man my guys are not learning how to pass guards because they're just dropping on the legs so then I, I basically wiped out leg locks from the entire curriculum mm. uh, to focus on to get better at jiu-jitsu and so you know it's always pros and cons going back and forth but that's how I got started in you know leg locks heavily and I actually competed in the um Sambo Nationals '99 and '98. I was a team captain in '90. I think it was '99. Um, yeah, at Quantico in Virginia. So 1999 was uh, there was an article in Gracie Mag that I saw. That I saw your name, the tough gringo. You know, my I, I was at the very bottom. But there's a big picture of you up in there. You know, for the team Brasileiro, you got put in with the black belt team. Brown and black belts were together. Yep. For that. And that was the first time that I saw your name. You know, was that the first time you went to Brazil? That was my first time I went to Brazil. I, I went to Brazil, landed as a purple belt. My instructor promoted me to brown belt like four or five days before this tournament. And then I, I, I fought Mario Suija from Alliance first round. How much does he weigh? He was like 280. At least. <laughs> yeah, he was big. How, how was that experience? Going was, to Brazil after all, the, after all these years of training? It was, it was great because, like I said, at, at, at that time, there had never been a non-Brazilian to beat a black belt Brazilian in, in, yeah. in Brazil, you know. And so it was like, okay, okay, okay. And luckily at that time, I, I had also been, I was um, heavily involved into judo through Roddy Ferguson, who was going for the 2000 Olympic team. He, he ended up um, becoming 
alternate in 2000 and became, made the Olympic team in 2004, but I was his main training partner. So mm-hmm. I was getting really good grip fighting and judo. So I felt confident with the understanding, of, you know, in, in jiu-jitsu, if, if you're bad on the ground, you go to the ground. If, it, if they're not good here, you know, you fight where you're, you have an advantage. But having that grip fighting ability gave me confidence, especially training with Rod D. I, I feel like if this guy going for the Olympic team, this guy who's not, he's not going to throw me. He's not going to put me down. So I didn't have that fear going in. And the match was good. Like I said, I'm in Brazil. I, listen, I loved it. I kissed the ground when I landed at the airport. I probably, probably shouldn't have done that because it was dirty, but I mean, the ground. But listen, I loved it. Like when I was, I never forget, man. I was almost, I was all emotional when I was when the plane was landing. You know, I could see. I like, damn, this is where Hoist was at. This is, this is it. You know, and like, like I said, I'm a kid. Hey, the story. It was, it was amazing, and I just, you know, loved every single second. Like walking on the mat, getting booed. Like back, back then, you know, I dropped back for a leg lock. Every, listen, the entire oh. arena booed. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was a great experience. Yeah, man. Back, I remember la- landing on the beach, uh, landing in Britain, Brazil. You see everything's like, uh, ra- ra- like rainforesty, right? And uh, yes. how, how was going? How was it going to the beach and seeing, just being in like drinking that coconut water? Yes. I was with the video. <laughs> the coconut water is my first time ever having uh, um, coffee. The, the little coffee shots they were taking. I took one of those shots, and you know, listen, it gave me the worst headache. Made me start spinning around. I did that once, and never did it again. But I. Listen, training, going to get acai, going to the beach, drinking coconut water, going home, eating, sleeping, going back, training, doing that cycle, it was the best thing ever. It was the best thing ever. And then also uh, getting getting indoctrinated to getting pulled over by the cops, having machine guns pointing at your head. You're like, oh, God. But that was a part of it. Like, like, well, tell, me, I, tell me that story. How that happened? You, you do? No, I, I do, but tell me, tell me, your, tell me your story. Yeah. The first time it was me, uh, Vonder Braga. I stayed after with them and um, to, after training. We uh, were driving down the road. Next thing you know, they, they were pulling, the cops were pulling us over there. They had like like all these machine guns on the, on the trucks. And uh, Vonder, like, he said, just don't say anything. Just be quiet. Just say, if you say anything, so you don't speak, I'll talk for you. And uh, But when they when they jumped out, man, they jumped out, had guns up to her, like, like literally on our head. Finger on the trigger. Yeah. Yeah, finger on the trigger. I'm like, damn. You know, but the funny thing was, at that time, I wasn't scared, like, because people I always talked about, I heard the stories, so I was like, man, the worst case scenario is just going to try to get, get you for money, and after that, then they'll, then they'll be over, and, you know, that's what happened, you know, it went for money, and I had some money on me, and gave them money, and they went about their business, but yeah. now, like I said, now it was scared the crap out of me. Yeah, there we had a couple stories where we went through tunnels, you know, and one of the guys didn't want to pay the toll. Yeah, they, they came up, came asked, came after us, you know. And I remember the the fingers were on the trigger, machine guns to the head, yelling at us, and then they saw the gi in the back and they let us go, you know. All right. <laughs> it, it's very mad. Some some people that, that aren't used to that would be, you know, jump real jumpy. Yeah, and one of the things I've always, uh, um, I really like put you, you know, really uh, looked up to you for is the, the work you've done in the community and the kids that you've, you've brought up over the years. You know, a lot of my kids compete against your kids. Like, I mean, I've seen the kids grow up, you know, and uh, your mom. And I remember even in the article, you've always like taught kids and you just invested so much into that, you know, how did that, how did that start? How did that program start? So we've always, we've always had the kids program. Um, but when, when we really took off and focused on the jiu-jitsu was from one of my trips in Brazil, um, I went to, you, you heard the team called Infight? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. So the head of Infight, I was going there a lot because I, I got swept by, I forgot the guy's name, Edson, Edson, Den, Edson, Denise. Edson, Edson, Denise. Edson, Denise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he had, um, he, I got swept by a guy from Gracie Baja with a butterfly sweep. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I never and I never heard of it before, you know what I'm saying? And I never never heard of it, never saw it, wasn't taught at it, know what the hell was going on. But all I knew was no matter what I was trying, I kept on getting swept. And he he hit me with that like like four or five times in the tournament. 
So then I was talking to my instructor afterwards, say, hey, what's that? Blah, blah, blah. He said, man, there's a guy named Edson who's very good at um, this suite, and uh, he'll, he'll, he'll help you show you. So I said, cool. So we, after the tournament, you know, the next day we went over to Infight to, for him to show me that. And then there was a bunch of kids there. And I, I was, after, afterwards, I was playing with the kids, rolling with the kids, having fun with the kids, but they were so awesome. And I was like, man, like they had, they had their hair dyed blonde. And like, I, I just want to keep on going back there, training with the kids. And they were talking about their life stories and, you know, what they deal with and stuff like that. And it was, it was very dear to my heart. And I was talking to the people. Like, they said, listen, at home, if you want to build a big team, you make sure you focus on the kids. Because in Brazil, 89%, the majority of the top people have all come from a kids program. And he, then he started explaining to me about all these different kids programs that are feeder into the bigger program. And then all the top guys at the time, they would say, Leo Zinho was from Leo Vera from here, this mm. person from here, Victor Salin from here. I'm like, Mark, damn. Was there, yeah. Yeah, so it, 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 it makes sense. I said, okay. And he said, once, once you start having good people, people, outside people are going to come, but always focus on homegrown. And, and he said, and the best homegrown is the kids because they have more loyalty. They're like, like what's, what's it called? Uh, Caron, 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 what, what's the word when you're a trader in there? Crown. Crown. Yeah, he, they always kept talking about that. He said, it, it, uh, kids don't crouch too much. And um, so anyway, long story short, I came back and I made a decision that I wanted to focus on the kids program. And um, started doing that. And then um, uh, I had a conversation with Master Donnie. I had to have him take over the kids. There was a guy named Dave Dave uh, Dave Dave Reeves, Master Paul. I had a few people that were teaching kids before mm. Master Donnie, and then once Master Donnie settled in, uh, he took it took, took the reins, and you know went, went with what we were doing. And Master Donnie was great because he was homegrown also, so I don't have any outside influence or anything. Everything is coming from what's being taught within the team within the system, and um. But that's what made me like want to really dig into the kids. I remember uh, going, you know, when I would fly to the East Coast for I would take a couple, put a couple of the kids from New Mexico out to compete, and I'd always see you roll up and uh, you know see all your kids rolling out of a bus. You'd bust them all over the East Coast through the tournaments. Yep. That so was, that was the plan, like getting them, getting them experience, going go on the road. It's like it's like high school children AAU sports you gotta get in the van get a hotel room hit the road yeah you you, you uh you seems like you finance like all these these kids and even you know in years later I would see a lot of the guys from flying out like as a team you know from from your gym you know like you've, you've supported these guys for a lot of years you know um whatever it takes is what, what's the what's the what's what's your what's your 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 intent with uh, with kind of supporting all of these guys, you know, what what does it mean to you? So the, the original intent was simple: as this. My goal was to become a UFC fighter, become a UFC champion, and become like the best in the world in jujitsu. And didn't do either one. And and I always said, you know, I started I started jujitsu when I was twenty six years old. And I was like, and I got like I said, I got really good. I mean, everyone who rose, they know, but it was like. I always wonder, I wonder what could have happened had I started as a kid and been in a good system because I've gotten as good as i gotten basically training by myself here. Like trying to go out and gather information and roll it, rolling. Remember, 85, 80% of my entire jiu-jitsu life, 20 plus, 24 plus years has been rolling with lower ranked students, you know, especially mm -hmm. like the first 10 years, you know, trying to build somebody up to be able to give you a hard time. So I always wonder like, what would happen if, I could have been in a program or what, for what could have happened with my MMA career had I been in a program not trying to teach myself. So I always say, I said, man, if I'm ever able to financially or whatever the situation, if I'm ever able to help support someone else, I'm going to build a program that I would want myself to be, have been in or that my, I would want my son to be in if he had that goal. So in the very beginning, that's what I wanted. I, I said, man, I, you know, coming from football, like 
college football, knowing how college football is, you, you're in college, you're living in the dorm room, all you're doing is, you know, doing your schoolwork, you're training, you're lifting, you're working out, you're going to football, you're watching film, like that concept, I said, you know, I'm going to do that. Plus having, you know, being a, a, a super duper think and grow rich Napoleon Hillhead, I said, you know, I'm going to take all these principles, all these principles of law of attraction, all these principles of uh, teamwork and training and, 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 and proper processes and I created my own program and got this house and put people in actually I didn't get the house first Mike Fowler was the first person Mike Fowler was the first person I put into the program mm. and so it's really like I didn't know what the hell I was doing so it was trial and error so and it takes usually two and a half three to five years to see if it if what the process is going to produce anything and then so every every three years Five years, you, you revamp, you review, you make analysis, and then you change, and now you're in the next process. So, Fowler was the first one to start getting a lot, a lot of results with Fowler. I was able to exaggerate those results from the aspect of learning how to market and direct response marketing. Uh, so I started, you know, marketing that stuff, and then um, Ryan Hall, uh, Ryan Hall, you know. I started flying him around all over the country because I probably in the first six to 12, 18 months, I had Ryan probably at a strong brown belt level guard with triangles. So now we're going fighting people. We're, we're under 12 months, so we're going to fight people 12 months and under. It's like fighting a black belt down there. So, but I did that because I wanted to get all these videos of him trying with people. So we had we had got to 200 triangles on video probably in the first 24 months just going tournament 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 and marketing him as the weak evil guy no strength no wrestling background and then people start taking even more notice so you know and then of course there's other, we had a lot of people that are winning but he was the, the poster guy and then after that then, you know it just started snowballing you know JT and everybody and. And Keenan became a big one, another big one through marketing. And, um, but that was my goal. My goal was to, listen, you have a dream. Like every, every single, every single body that's ever been here all had the same dream. And it was funny too, who was it? Um, somebody was talking to me yesterday about um, MMA. At, at the fighter house that we have for jujitsu people, we only had, I think, Three, three or four, no, four people that were interested in MMA more than they were in jiu-jitsu. And it was uh, Sajar Eubanks, Frank Camacho, Sadiq Youssef, and James Vick. And all all, all, all four made to the UFC, three of them are still in the UFC. Yeah. And um, I batted 100% based upon those concepts. And then everyone except one person who, who had only been at the school for maybe – one, no, two people. One had been there like nine months. One had been there for about 30 days. Had had lived in the house and had, did not become a world champion. You know, uh, except, no, JT, JT. JT didn't win world title at McGee, but we had clothes. We got silver at brown belt, and we got bronze at black. But, yeah, the process is flawless. You know, this is about being consistent. And now the process is really, really good. You know, there's no more guessing. We know what it takes to hit, hit that level at some homegrown or people come from the outside, but I'm very proud of the fact that all the people that came from the outside that became world champions, none of them had ever won a world title before. A lot of people, a lot of people always try to say, all you got to do is put a good bunch of good guys in a room and let roll. Man, if that's, if that's, listen, there's lots of floors that have great guys mm -hmm. and they will train all the time, but they're not producing those type of results. It's, it's a very unique system, you know, I'll say that. Yeah. I don't know the moment, you know, with you was, uh, I went to, I went to the uh, Abu Dhabi trials and I remember like, I put everything into trying to be the best and, you know, came back and I don't know, I was going to pay my bills, you know, and then I started talking to him all and he's like, yeah, you got to systemize everything, e-myth, talk about this e-myth book and, and then, uh, and so I went to a uh, uh, karate, uh, uh, was it, uh, what was his name in, in uh, Colorado? You uh, know. Stephen Oliver, Stephen Oliver. So I went to a karate, karate uh, learning uh, seminar, right? Uh, business seminar. And so they, they had, the moment was, who's done 5,000 hours of the technical training? And everybody raised their hand. 
who's done 5,000 hours of sales and marketing training and all the fat karate guys in the front and you, <laughs> you stood up, you know? And I was like, okay, that's, that's what I got to do. You know, that's what I got to do. And I uh, just opened my mind up, you know, of what, what business is, you know, um, yeah. you being the best doesn't translate over to you having a good business per se. Hello. So that was a big moment for me. It was a game changer, you know? And it's a moment that everyone needs to have at some point because sooner than, than later, because most people, it's sad when people, I, you know, last decade, high level, great people come to me, tell my man, well, can, can you help me? I wish I, I, don't, I don't have any money. I may have to close my schools. And then especially with the pandemic, yeah, I was watching the amount of, amount of schools that were closing. Man. Listen, and my events, I've been telling people, man, you got to save up. You got to be able, you got to be able to last six to twelve months, eighteen months preferably, and before you can start spending and buying houses and buying cars and doing all this other stuff, like you got money because you never know what can happen. And then, and, and and a lot of people didn't listen, and you see a lot of people closing now. Um, but yeah, it's sad. But for those that that get it. Is, is great. What was the moment for you? The moment for me was when I went to Brazil that for that tournament that that um that trial. I had no money. I had borrowed money from my mom to go to go to go to Brazil, and I really I was two or three months behind on my rent at the school. And I was like, man, I'm just going to Brazil. And um, and I got an email from Steve Oliver, and the subject line, subject line said, "Would you like to make an additional hundred thousand dollars in your martial arts school in the next twelve months?" I was like, hell yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I, I clicked the email and I opened it, and I read it, and um, it was like something like a two hundred or three two ninety seven or three ninety seven product. I called my mom, she gave me a credit card like she always does. I bought the product, and while while I was in Brazil, I started reading the book. It was um, things I wish I knew when I was twenty one, I think. And I was reading that, and I was going through some of his other stuff, and I started making changes on the fly. That was ninety nine, and um. And it, it made major differences. And that, that literally, when I, when I came, by the time I got back, I had enough money to pay it one or two months up. And I just needed the next billing cycle to happen to be able to catch up. And never looked back since then. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, um, you talked about uh, the Mike, Mike, the Mike, Mike Fowler and, and those, those guys. And I remember going to your gym and you were always been really open and open your doors up to, to, to helping other martial artists, other black belts out, you know, to do their business better, you know, since, uh, I mean, since as long as I can remember, early 2000s, you know, um, yep. started doing well and kind of making a name, you know, um, where does that, where does that come from? Like you mentioned that, you know, you want to for yourself, but how, where does that come from that you, you love it? You love it. Yeah. Obviously. Well, for me, it's like, people always feel like they're in competition with somebody where I never really feel like I was in competition with anybody. Although people feel like they're in competition with me, but like, like why? Like, like what's it about? Because listen, we snap our finger and we, we add 45 or 40 years to your life. You may not be doing this. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you'd be a grown grandfather, great, great grandfather. And it's like, it's, it's deeper than what it is. Everyone's, is locked into like now when you think think about future. We're not in a sprint. We're in a marathon for life. Like one of the most scary and fearful things on earth for most people is running out of money for retirement, um, or not even have be able to have a retirement. Right? Um, me, I'm not in competition with nobody. And if somebody wants to learn and somebody has a hunger to learn, I want to teach you. Like like right like right now. Like I'm like from events where there's Help people, help coaches uh, define their process or help their school. I'm always, I've always been open with it. You know, whether you're my student or not my student, whether I knew you or not, I'm, if I don't know you. Yeah. Um, but that's just me. Like, like if you leave the jiu-jitsu world or leave martial arts, I'm like that in every area of my life. I'm always trying to help people. And but behind the scenes, people are so not used to it that people have to always think that there's an ulterior motive. Right. There's no ulterior motive, motive. And if anyone ever took the time to sit down, hey, you know what, can I ask you a question? Why did you, you do this? And why did you do that? And then if they heard the answer, you know, they, oh man, I never thought about that. 
I thought it was because of, and they, they and whatever they think it was was always something that was devious or they they thought it was like it had to be more. It's not more of it. Like like me helping you open your school or me helping you increase your student base or me helping you get better. Just don't hurt me. It don't hurt me. It's not going to hurt me. It's not going to help me. Now, if you go against one of my students, it could hurt me if, if, if what I taught you was, you know, going to help you beat them. But just in a regular, a, a regular conversation or one day or one week or one weekend, that's not going to make, you know, like if you beat us, you deserve it, you know. Right. But but from that side, as far as systems, like I didn't really start opening. I mean, I opened up a lot, but like I said, with my, my blueprint system I'm coming out with, I'm getting released. The reason I'm releasing it now is more so because the MMA uh, business or the, the oh the grappling blueprint the twelve pro champion program. Uh-huh. The, re- the reason I'm finally going to do that now is because I, I've, I've reached all my goals in the grappling and jujitsu. I only had two goals. One was to get a um, a black belt world champion, and two was to get a UFC world champion. And after that, I was done. We got the UFC world champion early on. And it took, it took a little while to get the Black Belt World Champion. We ended up getting two in 2018. And after that, man, I'm an open, open. A person thought I was an open book before. I'm an open, open book now. Yeah, you didn't. When I, it's funny. I was at one, I was one of your, the, one of your seminars and, and then uh, got, I got the call. I think I was with you actually when we got the, when I got the call for, uh, for Jerry Papazian to fight. Um, um, yep. <laughs> yeah. My East. Mike Easton. Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> it's crazy, you know, like the, the universe art works. You know, you talked about three percent, three percenters, like Napoleon Hill can go, they can go rich, and these systems. You know, can you talk a little bit about that, like mindset, and what what makes a champion a champion, world champion, not just a champion, right? Yeah. So it's 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 interesting because like the three percent mindset people were you know at the time i was pushing three percent uh people try to demonize it and say it's an elitist position but it's not an elitist position you know there's there in every sport and every business and every niche there's three percent of the population that ride and then you think, think let's use sports i'll use football so college football you have division one division one could be like three percent there's people in division two and division three that are great too but in college football, then you get the 3%. The 3% of the people that are going to end up getting drafted. And then once you, you get to draft and you go to the NFL, within the NFL, there's 3%. Those are all Americans, all, I'm sorry, all pros, you know. Um, and then you have the 3% of those people who what? Are the Hall of Famers. And so it just, it just niches down. And it, it's all about what you're willing to do. It's about the process that you're in. Because, you listen, you could be a 3% mindset and go hard as you want and are dedicated as you want. But if you're not in a system that can get you to where you want to be, then you have a very small likelihood of ever making it. That's why I always tell people, I said, man, the most important thing is this. Understanding reality versus make-believe. So just let's talk about jiu-jitsu. In the reality of jiu-jitsu, if, if I'm a student and my goal is to become a black belt world champion and I go to a school and I'm training at a school that has never made a black belt world champion, then I have to understand that they don't know how to make a black belt world champion. Now, if I want to trust the instructor and hope to be his first black belt world champion or I think some of one of his other students will be a black belt world champion, Listen, I have you have that right, and I'm thankful that all my students trusted me enough to stay on board while we're trying to get that black world title. All of them didn't. People were in the ear saying, "Oh, they can't do it. You need to go over this cabin. You need to do it. No problem." But it's like the reality. But if you talk about this, any instructor that has not created a black world champion may be mad at what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But why would you be mad? Like, I'm not, I'm not telling the I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth. I was in that same exact situation. I felt the pressures, Alberto. I, I, listen, I felt the pressure when we were doing it. It was like, blue belt world champion, we're happy. Purple belt, oh, yeah, man, double to go, quadruple gold, double grand slam, purple belt, oh, double gold, brown belt, 
but you can't do black belt. When it was blue belt, I can't do blue belt. When it was purple, I mean, pur when it's purple, I couldn't do purple. Then, oh, you can't do a brown. It was always the next level. And then when I got to the black, you couldn't do black. We got the bronze medal. Oh, you can't get gold. Oh, I got the silver medal. Can't do gold. Was, oh, and being competitive, right? But back to the point, this is the reality a person has to understand. If you want to be, if you want to become a, an Olympian, then are you going to bet your life going with a coach that has created Olympians or someone who hasn't and has a strong desire to? And for me, had, had, had I known what I know now, back when, like, say, Fowler and them came through, Jesus, Jesus, it, it, it would have been ridiculous. I didn't know. I'm, I'm making things up, doing the best I can with what I got and, and trying. Um, so when it comes to the 3%, on that concept, it, 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 it's a lot to it. But the, the overall mindset, listen, Steph, just take the student. You whether you're trying, you're going to shoot your shot with a person who's never done it, or you're going to shoot your shot with somebody that has done it, you still have to have a, a mindset. You have to have a belief system. And, and let me let me niche it down one more time because, say for example, there are people who have. We say, well, that person created a black belt world champion. Okay, well, what type of black belt world champion did they create? Well, well, this person came over to them as an already good black belt, and they helped them create a become black belt world champion. Okay, that's different. You're not you're not a black belt, and you're not really a good black belt, let alone not being a black belt at all. You're you started here, so you're you're considered homegrown, because if a person is only good at taking people who are already good, and he can make them world champions, then that's his skill set. Does not mean that they, that same person can take a person from scratch and make them world champions. Does that make sense, or does it sound crazy? Yeah, sounds good. That's it. And or or this person is creating world champions females, but you're a male. Right. Or males, you're a female. So you have all these different levels. But no, male, female, no matter what the situation is, the the person has to have a mindset. They have to have a belief system. Because there's certain, listen, at the black belt level, there's certain things you just, like at blue belt, you could be a great wrestler and have great, great judicial technique, and you could maybe get it done. Mm -hmm. but, but if your technique's a little flawed, but there's no flawing your technique at black belt. You know what I'm saying? Like you could be a great wrestler, and they don't care enough about that because the guy will pull guard, and his technique his technique is, is flawless in the guard. So um, the whole thing, well, Rick, you know, Napoleon Hill took, you know, 500 of the world's most successful, richest people over a 20-year period, put them together, and hired Napoleon Hill to study them, hang out with them, research them, and find out the most common traits, find out all the commonalities of the world's richest and most successful people. And like I said, after a 20-year period, after 20 long years, he came up with 13 commonalities and 13 principles. And and when you think about that, when they give you the book, the thing go rich, they give you the blueprint. You can sit there and read it. I, I always think about specialized knowledge. In the book I have, it, it, it says, uh, I think it was on page 47, it says, specialized knowledge is not the type of knowledge gained in traditional universities and or colleges. And for me, I went to college, took seven years to get out, got a, a business marketing degree. Um, and I'm not making one single penny from anything that I learned in college. And everything that I learned, like I said, from Stephen Oliver's course, and then going to his events, and then connecting with Dan Kennedy, and studying direct response marketing, and came up, like that was the knowledge that I gained, which is considered specialized knowledge that I gained that allowed me to start on my journey of what I've done. And to, in 2020, it rang true. In 2000, it rang true. It's, it's the same thing. So uh, a, a, a individual, an athlete, or a person in business, whatever, they have to be on a mission and a quest to gain specialized knowledge. And if they're finding a mentor, like I said, mentor is one of the um, key commonalities in the book. Uh, having a mentor and for just people, it will be your, your instructor. And what is their specialized knowledge? You know, what have they done? And so it, it just, it's just, it's just constantly stacks on and on. I can literally talk for four day, four, a four day mm -hmm. event on this. And I get excited about it because anybody who understands these concepts can guide themselves to greatness with, um, through himself, through studying with a mentor. Um, but, not, not, not making excuses. You know what I mean? You know, no, no excuses, no whining, no bitching, no complaining, no moaning. 
blaming take responsibility for your own action, no blaming others. Um, and for athletes, when as soon as a person loses, the first thing to do is to say, oh, if it wasn't for this, like when we're going for the Bible World title, if somebody don't win a Bible World title or something like that, you want to blame, blame the team or blame the thing. Like that's, that's a blame game. And that's not what you're supposed to do. And you have, you have a fine line. 97% of the population does these things. We consider them, you know, the, the loser mindset. 3% of the population does these things. And then you can just watch your behavior, your thought process to see if you are on the loser side or winner side. I, I give you a good example. I have a thing um, in the blueprint I've been doing 24 years called the 135 pound philosophy. And the 135 pound philosophy is, is this. So if you go to any gym, weight gym across the world, and you have a bar for 245 pound plates on each one, 145 pound plate on each side, it's 135 pound pounds. It's standard weight. You can go to the most steroid, geeked up, body lifting gym in the world. You put the strongest guy, the most steroid using guy on the bench, and start telling him to crank out 135 pounds. Mm. One thing for a fact, no matter, he can crank, 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 crank. No matter what happens, we know for a fact that at some point, what's going to happen? It's going to fatigue. Yeah. No if, no and, no but. So I created the 135 pound philosophy because I say anybody that's 135, I'm sorry, 185 pounds and below, I consider them lightweights. Anybody 185 more, I, you know, they're out of the lightweight category. But what happens is this: if I'm 200 pounds, I'm going against a 300 pounder. Now let me let me let me say, if I'm 135 pounds. Going against a 225 pounder, and the 225 pounder, I'm trying to pass the guard. I get to the cross side. 225 pounder bridges me up, bitch presses me off from cross side. The loser mindset: Oh, woe is me. There's no way I can beat him. He's too strong. Whatever the the loser mindset self talk is. Mm. The 125 pound philosophy we make makes us excited because wow, you know what? That's one rep. We look at it, he bridged me up, but that's one rep. Now, I have to land in base. Now, I'm excited. I'm not, whoa, he's me. I can't be. I'm like, all right, let's see how many more reps you got. And I'm going back in. And now, he can bridge me again. Bridge me again. That's five reps. Let's go, baby. Let's go. I got to land in base, but I can keep on going. So, we have, I have all these different categories within this 135-pound philosophy to help people stay on the positive 3% mindset instead of taking the woe is me, especially for a person the first day. First the person the first day comes in, gets choked by a little girl, they're going to be crying, woe is No, no, that's not what it is. And I, I think it's very valuable because sometimes when a person starts jujitsu, you may not have communication with the, the upper belt. You may not have communi communication with the instructor. You may not have gotten there yet, or you may be introverted. You don't talk. So you may say, if you don't quit, you may train six months, 12 months, getting your ass whipped, and you're and you're doing all these negative bitch assness self-talks in your own mind, trying to make yourself feel better, but now you've damaged yourself for an entire year, and it's hard to get that out. Right. It takes, like, so many positive to, to correct a negative. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What's, uh, what's your proudest moment? When was the, what was, what was the year of the black belt? Uh, 2018 or 18, right? 2018. 18. So you finally did it. What are some of your proudest moments being a coach after all these years? Watching your little kids, your kids grow up, become not only champions on the map, but champions in life. I'm going to tell you the truth. One of the probably the most proudest moments I had was our, our first black belt uh, in, our, in, our, in our martial arts program named Ryan Villagram when he graduated from college because his mother had a conversation with me one night at my school and the conversation was weird, but she was just talking about her kids, what she wanted them to stay, want them to stay involved in martial arts. And, uh, you know, even if she's not around, like she wants, you know, what well, she made me, she made me promise her that I would keep them in martial arts and so forth. And so long story short, Conversation was over. She uh, gave, got, gave me a hug, kissed me on my cheek, and then she left. Man, the next day, got a call. She tried to commit suicide, and she took pills. And that that day she took the pills, ended up killing her. Like, I, I can't remember how long, how many days it was after that she actually died from going to the hospital, but she died. And her 
for kids. Like, and there was no father in the life. So, I mean, we were the school. You know what I'm saying? Like, they didn't have to pay. They didn't have to this and that. One of the one of the moms from our school, um, Carlo, his mom adopted, like, physically adopted one of the kids. Uh, Ryan went to went away to college. We helped him stay stay focused, stay in school. Went to college. I helped him, you know, with his off campus housing, pay money, you know, like whatever he had to do. But the day that he graduated from college, because he's the first person in his family to graduate from college. The day that he graduated college, my me, and my mom, and we all went to the entire team. The entire team, all the kids, all like the entire team, saw seeing him walk across the stage. That was probably like one of my proudest moments, you know, as a business owner, as a instructor, and so forth. Because a lot of people say, "Oh, Lord, you just worry about winning." Is that like, listen, winning in the tournaments and the medals is a byproduct of a system. Mm. What these people do at the end of their life, because understand this, I know for a fact that you're not going to be competing for the rest of your life. I know for a fact, like like when I do internet marketing and I tell people that you need to create a brand, you need to create a business and they don't do it, that hurts me. But they get so locked into competing, but I understand what's going to happen to them if they don't have money, if they don't have a skill. And while you're, it's so easy, man, if you're focusing all this time and you just want, like, I don't have a problem with you dedicating all your life to jiu But while you're dedicating life to jiu build this specialized knowledge on the back end because you can build a big business. And I've been pitch, preaching this for t- almost 20 years now. Um, so people think that it's the medals. It's not the medals. I love the medals. I love the competition. I love competing. I love training for that. But it's not the medal. The medals just happen to be it. And whether a person, listen, whether I, I love the people, I love the guys and the gals, no matter if they win or they lose. My thing since they were kids, 20 plus years, I say this on, on the floor. Anybody who's been in the program any period of time as a child will hear, I stand in front of the stage. So listen, I don't care if you win, lose, or draw. As long as you go out there, implement the system, try your best. Don't give up. I don't have I don't I don't I don't have tolerance per se for quitting. If a kid quits in the beginning, he may be scared, he may be nervous. We help build them. But once you're in the system and you know, I don't have a thing of quitting. If you get tired and get out of shape, that's on you. That's not acceptable either because we're doing the conditioning. We're not we're not a school that's known for getting tired. You're not doing something. Um, and then if you're if you're not dedicating your time and doing it like if you if if you have five days a week that you can train and you're only training three times a week because you're two days a week you're playing Fortnite, that's your prerogative. We're not going to force you. But if you lose, there's no need to be crying. There's no need to cry. You can't cry now man, when you didn't give it your best effort. Give it your all. Do your best effort. And so, yeah, so the, it, it, Ryan Villagram's graduation from college was my probably my best moment. Lowest. Lowest moment. I, I think it rings my head. Lowest moment was, and this could be wrong because I'm, I'm just thinking of something that's re- right recent on my head. That it, it, it was the it was a year of the world, I think it was, and James Vick was fighting. In California in the UFC and Muhammad was competing Muhammad was competing um, in Jiu-Jitsu and his first round was against Popolo from Lovato School I think it was uh, James Popolo and so I left the venue I, I'm trying to time because like wor- listen world is world I've, I've only missed one world ever in my life is because Brandon Vera fought in the UK and I couldn't be there and UK always gave the precedence over the, the jitsu, but Vic fought at the same time. Where it just so happened to be in California, so I was hoping that I was hoping that uh, the times didn't conflict, but it did. So I, I was staying at the venue as long as I could. Muhammad didn't compete. I had to f- drive to the the UFC event. Went in there. They said Muhammad. No, no, Muhammad had competed. I went in there. James Vic got knocked out. I had to leave. I couldn't, you know, sit back there and console him and talk to him and go to the hospital, which I always do for 20 plus years, all the fight. I couldn't do that. I had to, I had to get back in the car and drive back to the venue. And Muhammad was uh, competing, and they put me on Facetime. I'm trying to coach from Facetime, blah blah. And Muhammad lost. So 
that was our black belt hopeful at time. You know what I'm saying? And so it was like, fuck, lost in the UFC. We didn't get the Bible world title. I wasn't there for Muhammad. We worked all year and I wasn't there for him. Like, it, it's talking about like a heart, a, st- a knife in my heart, man. And I'm sure there's probably more, more, but that one, as far as a coach, from a coach's perspective, that one was a bad one for me. You know, I just remember like the, you know, I was part of the, you know, I used to go to the the consulting, the consulting, the MMA uh, group and, and, uh, and then the stuff happened with, uh, you know, with the guys from your fighter house and just like everything kind of imploded. And then, you know, I've known your mom forever, you know, and, you know, I know she had, you had beaten cancer once. And then I was just, I, I can't help but kind of think like, I, I thought about you. I was like, man, oh, you know, it's, I know you're tough and you never give up and you're, you know, tough as hell. But I mean, I, I just know how much she's done for how much part of she is in the school and for those kids, you know, they're like, you know, they, she's raised a lot of those kids, you know, I don't know how they, they interact with her. Oh yeah. As far as, as far as lowest part point in my life, my uh, mom died. No, if no, and no, but I thought you were coming from coaching. Yeah. yeah. If, you were, if, you were, if you were there at, in Florida, when all that stuff happened, I got the call. Um, I, they took me off the stage. I got the call and found out what was happening. Like, man, um, and at the time, I didn't know how bad it was going to be, you know what I'm saying? But I know it was, it was bad. Um, and but the thing is, like, like, my mom was going through the, pro- the problems and stuff during that, right? right? And but she wasn't really affected by all of that. And when the guys, when the guys that left, the only thing that made me sad about the guys that left, like, there, there, there was there was one person that who left that didn't come talk to me, you know what I'm saying? And and I, I did so much for them that I thought that at least. I feel like I did. I failed. I failed from a perspective of that. I didn't teach you how to be a man enough where you at least come eye to eye. Like Jimmy Harbison, he left, but he didn't leave with them per se. He stayed after a while, but but when he when he when he left, like he came to talk to me. Yeah. We sat down. We went to the you know, eat. He, he, we went to the gym one more time. We rolled over a little bit. We're here. We're here, and we had a conversation, you know. And um, but one uh, one guy. Didn't didn't have that conversation. I wish he had, would have, but he didn't. Um, but man, my mom, like what, what was going on with my mom was precedence, you know, and like overall big scheme of things. She wasn't she wasn't tripping about that. She she didn't like the the attacks that were happening, seeing that happen to her son. But she knew I was like I'm like cool, like like this is what happens. This is what how it goes down sometimes. Um, but yeah, but but her her dying. Oh my god, listen, it put me out of commission, literally. For three, three and a half years, man, it was bad. Because I'm the only child. I was mama's boy. It was horrible. What's the What's the legacy you want to leave for your family and and uh, and students? The legacy, I mean, for me, is they know that. They know, listen, there's there's not nobody. Listen. Whether they're here still or they're gone, there's nobody that can look me in the eye or look anybody in the eye and tell the truth to say that I didn't go all out for them to reach their goal or spend extra time. Like right now, like think about this. For the last four months, our school has been shut down. I took out my Aston Martin for my garage. I only have a two-car garage. So I took out my exotic cars, put it at a friend's house, I, I converted the entire garage to a mat space. And every day, twice a day, for two and a half hours, I'm in the garage coaching the guy. Me with my mask on. I don't want to take no chance of getting sick. I have eight, I've had nine friends die already. But I'm there. Corona, pandemic, spending my money. And then now the school's going to be back open. I, I haven't even been driving my car. I don't want to drive, go over there. It is, it's about to be, you know, summer almost, man. I mean, summer passed. I didn't have my drive my car, um, and but I've been in there. Now I have to get a heater in there. I probably spent fifteen, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars, you know, getting all that done, set up in there. Um, now we're going to be out of there, but but that's how I, I've always been. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to spend the time. And and on the business side, like Dan Kennedy always says, that as long as you have a passion and love, you you can um you can piss your time away as long as you understand you're actually pissing it away. Um, and we have an inside joke. If I spent that amount of time that I've spent consistently for 24 plus years on a business, I could have had that hundred million dollar business by now. You know what I'm saying? But it's my passion, it's my love, what I, what I love. So I'm pissing it away. But 
I understand I am. So um, legacy, I mean, I, listen, when I got in this game, I understand I didn't get in this game to start teaching. I got in this game to become a UFC champion, be like Hoyce Gracie. I was forced into teaching and whatever I do, I try to do, do my best of my ability. And I want to, legacy is tricky. You know what I'm saying? I want to give people the ability to live a life and take care of themselves and support themselves financially, you know, through the business side of things, give them passing their art to them that I love. Uh, even my affiliates, like I have, a, I have affiliates around that, you know, people that are, their students don't even understand how all the affiliates came down and how they started and, and how the student, how the, you know, they don't understand the entire process of how this machine has, has happened and they get the benefit from it, but I don't need them to know it's I'm happy that I see that that person is doing great and their students are doing great and I know where it came from, you know? Um, so I'm not sure, you know, a lot of people say, like, I want everyone to know, like, I don't really care. Like a lot of people, like if, if everyone knew all the people I've affected, all the people I've touched, all the people I've helped behind the scenes, all the people they look up to, if they knew they'd be surprised. I don't, I, I don't, I don't go out and don't need it per se. My, my, my helping is genuine help. It's not helping to make more money or helping to get more fame. It's to help and help. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a marketer and I love marketing. I'm going to do my marketing. The direct response to my thing, if, I'm, if I have something to sell, I'm going to market to sell it, right? Um, but I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's a hard question. My legacy is more so, like I said, to, 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 to have done my best, taught, gave, provided. For the, like, I give you, let me give you a good example. My martial arts school, I don't need my martial arts school. I could literally close my martial arts school, go buy me a thousand square foot facility, put a boxing ring cage, and just train MMA fighters, right? I'm not going to close the school. I got kids. I Listen, I know the stories of thousands and thousands of kids over the last two decades, thousands of teenagers, adults, people who, men who walked into the academy couldn't give you great, good eye contact, couldn't give you a firm handshake. I know how they are now. I know that they're going to be able to get, go to a job. They're going to get an interview, to, uh, have, have an interview. They can get married one day, have kids. I know that that man is not going to pass off some soft putting traits to their child. You know what I mean? And that child will never meet me. You know what I mean? But the, the fact that that child will have been raised by a parent who has been through the program and understand about discipline and confidence, self-respect and self-esteem that they'll pass it to their child and that child will pass it to their child and that child will pass it to their child. Like all that, that's real stuff people don't think about. That's, that's reality. It increases somebody's self-esteem may stop them from committing suicide. I've already seen it before. I know it for a fact. So keeping the school open and, and, and providing the services, that's the legacy. The legacy is known inside my heart when I die, the impact that I've had, you know? Well, I'm, I'm one of those guys you've helped out. You've, like you said, you've helped people directly and indirectly, like for me helping other people too. So I'm one of those people. I remember, you know, uh, I, I always open up a second location and the ultimate fighter was coming out as you got, he's like, you got to do a 30 second spot during the ultimate fighter, the first ultimate fighter. And, uh, you know, blew up the school, like almost instantly. And it was from one tip. I listened and I, I, I took action, you know, and did what you said. Action. And uh, I mean, and everything you've always told me, you know, and there was nothing to you for you to gain. You didn't gain anything from that. You just wanted to help me. And so I've always appreciated that, you know, from the bottom of my heart, you know, my, you've helped me my, meet myself, my family uh, and others, you know, without them even knowing, you know, so I want to appreciate everything you've done for me personally. I want to appreciate everything that I've seen you do for your community, your kids. I seem to grow up and not only become like champions, like I said, on the mat, but in life, you know, going to college and just, you know, really, uh, you know, being being champions in life. So I really, you know, I appreciate, you know, all the work that you do for your community, even though I'm not there, but what I've seen, you know, and uh, the example that you've set. And of course, you're uh, inspiring others, you know, inspiring all of us to, to, to be our best, to live our best lives. So thank you so much for all that you do. Um, you want to plug any and uh, any, any uh, the grappling grappler, grapplers? Uh, uh, what's the grapplers? The game plan? Well, or but of course, <laughs> um, listen, I've taken. I wrote. I wrote a book about fifteen plus years ago called The Grappling Game Plan. I sold the okay. product like two hundred, two hundred eighty dollars for the entire big package. Mm -hmm. uh, I took it off the market for fifteen years. I recently opened. I, I made it back available about last year in October and I'm giving it away for free. Mm -hmm. 
it is the mindset, mental tricks, strategies, competition. If you compete, whether you don't compete, you, just, you compete in school, whatever it may be, this book has been responsible. It's one of the things that has been used to help people reach the world title at blue, purple, brown, and black belt, gi and no gi. And I'm giving it away for free. All I had asked for people to pay shipping and handling, $9.95 in domestically and $19.95 out of the country. Uh, but I paid for the book. Uh, I already printed them. All you have to do is go to the the grapplinggameplan.com that's www.thegrapplinggameplan.com I have to say it one more time as being a marketer www.thegrapplinggameplan.com get a free book and I guarantee you love it and if you don't like it you can send it back and I'll give you your shipping and handling back